morning. It is wonderful seeing all of you here this morning, even if it is with masks on. That's all right, though. I like being close to you. I like speaking directly to you, fist bumping you, elbow bumping you. So glad that you're with us this morning. It's good to see uh, Lucas here with us. Uh, glad he came for a visit. Uh, the Ephersons, Kelly, uh, the girls, Josh, they're here. So glad that they're here as well. And any other visitors we might have, super glad you're here. And I hope that while you're here, you'll find a loving bunch of people. Sickeningly, sickeningly so, loving bunch of people. Because uh, we love each other, and we love you, and we want you to be here. Let's see what the Bible says. What about that? Let's turn to the book of Galatians, please. The book of Galatians, the New Testament, is made up largely of letters written by Paul, written by James, written by Brother Peter. And we look to these New Testament writings and say, how does this apply to us today? This was the early days of the Lord's church, of the church of Christ, the church that Jesus died for. And we look and try to find examples and try to apply them to today so that we might make wise decisions, so that we might make loving decisions, so that we might reach the law, so that we might reach the world with the love of Christ and with its wisdom, with its wisdom. Now, I've heard it said we are drowning in, for, in information of all the information that is created out there in the world by, you know, uh, nine-year-olds that have YouTube channels or people, mothers and, and, daughter, and uh, uh, fathers and other people who have something to say and they create blogs. There's all kinds of information that is out there, yet we are starving for wisdom. And it is the Word of God that can give us that wisdom. And I hope you'll look at this with me today. The book of Galatians. It was written to early Christian converts from Judaism. Acts chapter 2, loads of Jewish people say, we are done with the old law. Christ came to fulfill the old law. We now want to follow him. And it was those Jews that on that day, the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, those Jews became Christians. Then they were scattered, right? They went to different cities. They went to different places. Continued worshiping, continued learning and being together as, as Christ has instructed us to be. And then Paul started writing letters to them all to this congregation in Galatia, to this congregation in Thessalonica. Because Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, knew that these congregations needed instruction. They needed guidance. They needed wisdom. So what did Paul write about? Well, he would have written about what the people were dealing with in that day and time. He was writing about the political, the social, and the personal struggles of these early Christians who, remember, were once Jews. Because you see, these former Jews who are now Christians are thinking to themselves, I used to do this, but now I'm supposed to do this. And there's a struggle there, right? There's this idea that they're supposed to be doing something new, and, and that's a struggle. So Paul is writing to instruct them. Paul is writing to encourage them. Well, as we look at what he wrote to the Galatian church, we also see that he wrote this letter to us in many ways. As Brother Jim and I discussed this morning in our discussion on Jeremiah, and as we look to the New Testament scriptures as well, you will see that humans don't change very much. We just do things a little differently. But our same motivations, our same struggles, they haven't changed much at all. The struggle of early Jewish Christians would be to understand the relationship they have with Christ. Because their value early on was, you know, Abraham was our father. Moses led us out of the land of Egypt. We sacrificed through the temple to, the, to God with the assistance of the high priest. Well, now there's this whole new thing that's come about. Jesus Christ is our high priest. You don't have a dividing wall, a dividing curtain between you anymore. Now you have a direct line to the Son of God. This is something very new to these new Jewish Christians, as they're often referred to as. One of the things Paul would have to work on was establishing the importance of grace as compared to the law. Right? These Jewish Christians, they knew how to follow the law, but now there's this new thing come about. It was in the Old Testament as well. Grace is mentioned in the Old Testament. But now there's this new thing that, that Christ wants to be put to the forefront, that of grace. Well, the Jews knew what it was to follow law, right? These are rules that you must follow. A lot of times laws 
are based on your performance, right? If it's a law in your home that your students have, that your children have good grades, that's a law that they must follow, correct? And also based on your performance, how much money do I have, right? If I work harder, I'll have more money. And so it's based on your performance. That's much how laws work. Grace, on the other hand, is, says, despite your imperfections, despite how much you've done, despite how little you have done, whatever the case may be, God says that because of grace, I still love you. Obedience is still important. But what grace does that the Old Testament law could not do is that it offers a reprieve from perfection. You don't have to be perfect for God to say, I love you and I want you to be a child of mine. Again, obedience is still important. We've got to, we've got to not throw that out the door. okay? But what grace does is it shows more of a communication of love and of for forgiveness to you rather than, oh, you messed up, I'm sending you straight to hell. God doesn't want to do that. God wants to reach out and wants to save his people. Now that's what, this is the, these are the sort of things that Paul is trying to communicate to the church at Galatia. Imagine being in a group of people, the Jewish people, right? Whose prominent leaders despised Jesus. You looked up to these men. You followed, did what they asked you to do because they knew the law, right? They knew what it was to be a Jewish child of God at that time, and you're following them. But these men despised Jesus. What would you do? Would you continue following them? Or would you follow the one who is the fulfillment of the law that the prophets talked about would come and would save mankind from his sins? Imagine having friends, as all of us do, and your behavior dependent on having these friends or not? Would you change to follow Christ? Would you, if you learned of something today that you're doing wrong or that you've been mistaken by, would you change or would you continue to follow the path that you've been on to maintain a certain level of friendship? That's the struggle that the Galatian church uh, face, and that's the struggle all of us face today, young and old alike. So Paul gives the church at Galatia some very important tips, and we're going to study one lesson that he teaches from each chapter. We're going to study these this morning and see how they apply to our lives. Will you follow these tips? Will you follow these lessons? Or will con you continue on a bad path, perhaps? In Galatians chapter 1, Paul instructs the Christians there to not live for the approval of others. Don't we do that? Sometimes this group is known as people pleasers. I've got I've to please my family members. I've got to please my friends. I've got to do anything it takes to make these people happy. That is a losing game, my friend. That is a game that you're going to continue to play and you're going to continue to feel empty because perhaps you're not taking care of yourself spiritually or emotionally speaking. You're trying to take care of everybody else. You see, everybody's got to like me. I've got to be on everybody's good side. Jesus came and he made a lot of people mad. You know what that does? That means it's okay if I make people mad. Hopefully for the right reasons. And I hope that your life resembles that of Christ, I hope it makes people uncomfortable because we don't need to be living for the approval of other people. We need to be following Christ and His teachings as Paul is trying to get the Galatian church to do. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6 says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting Him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. So all these people committed to Christ and Paul says to them, hey, you're already deserting Him? Are you kidding me? You're already leaving him? You had, you had his posters on your wall last week, and you're already tearing those down? You had the shirt that said, I love Jesus, and you've already replaced that with something else? You've turned away from him, and you've turned to some other gospel. Verse 7, which is really not another. You know, I don't even know what other gospel you're talking about. You're saying some preacher's coming through town, and he's telling you this and that, and it's different. 
than what I told you? Listen, I, Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you about the one and only gospel you should be following. You shouldn't be following anybody else's because there is no other. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. They want to turn it around. They want to make it say something different, maybe because it's easier, maybe because it's more comfortable. There's only one gospel that we should be following. And when you come to church here, or perhaps you visit someplace else, you need to be able to see all around you and how it relates to the Word of God, not by man. A lot of churches out there want to please man, want to please the crowd, because guess what? That brings people in. Well, it's not going to change people for Christ. It's just going to keep them on a path of sinfulness. Talking about that different gospel here that Paul warns against, it's got to come from the Bible if you're following Christ today. Verse 10 says, For I am now seeking the favor of men or of God. Who am I trying to please, he says in verse 10. Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. That's why we are here today. We are Christians and we want to be that bond servant of Christ. We want to be pleasing to Him. There are many groups that seek to please man. One of the easiest to look at is that of politicians. These seek, to, seek the favor of man for power, for personal gain, for financial reasons. Acts 12, verses 1 through 3. Now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. Okay? And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. So Herod, he wants to please man. So here's some Christians, let's, mis let's mistreat them. In fact, let's kill a cousin of Jesus with the sword. Let's go ahead and kill James. That'll make the people even happier. When he saw that it pleased the Jews to put these to death, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Politicians haven't changed much. They want to please man rather than God. Acts 25 and verse 9, But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me on these charges? And of course, Paul and Festus have a, have a discourse about this, about where he should be tried and even if he should be tried. But yet another example of a politician trying to please man. What about you? What do you try to do to please men? School is starting back soon. Might be in the classroom, might not. But we know that the dynamic among students is, I want to have a lot of friends. I want to have a boyfriend. I want to have a girlfriend. I want to be considered popular. So what are you going to do? You're going to do those things that will make you popular as quick as possible. And whatever that looks like, you run headlong into it, young people, oftentimes, because you want people to look at you and say, hey, you're cool. You know, it's changed over the years as far as what you do and how you do it, but it's still the same motivation. I want to be popular. Now, the question is, is what you are doing making you a stronger Christian, making you a better Christian, or is it making you pleasing to man? And what did the verse say a moment ago? Am I to be pleasing to man or to be pleasing to to God. So don't live for the approval of others. John chapter 12. In this chapter, Jesus was teaching and performing signs. But many people were not believing in him. He was doing all sorts of things to try to get people to believe, but they had hard hearts. And see, there's some hard hearts in here this morning. I'm speaking from the Holy Word of God, inspired Word of God, and many people are saying, uh, I'm not sure I'm ready to change, Dale. I still like having the approval of man. Well, Jesus was doing all sorts of signs. Man still was not believing, so there you are with that. Verses 42 and 43 say, Nevertheless, many, even of the rulers, did believe in him. So there were people who believed. You're walking down the hallway in school in a few weeks. You're walking down the hallway, and you believe what I told you this morning. You believe that your behavior should be pleasing to God. But what happened? Even of the rulers, what did they do? Because of the Pharisees, they were not going to confess him. I believe in Jesus. Let's say I'm a teenager at White House High, Heritage High, 
Portland, many others we have represented here, station camp, day school, home school, have a lot represented here. But I'm walking down the hallway and you say, you know, I believe what Dale said about Galatians yesterday in chapter 1, not to be the, have the approval of others, but the cool kids, I want their approval first. So I'm not going to confess Jesus for fear that you would be put away from the cool people. No? What's it say? Be put out of the synagogue. That's what the rulers and the Jewish people even in that day said. I believe in Jesus, but I want to be pleasing to man. Why? Because they love the approval of the cool people. Because they love the approval of those who have certain social circles rather than the approval of God. God's going to save your soul someday, not the people you sit next to in algebra class. Keep that in mind. Proverbs 29, 25, another lesson. Of course, from the book of Proverbs, you can always get good lessons from there. The fear of man brings a snare. In other words, if you fear man, if you fear the Pharisees, if you fear certain groups, certain social circles in your school, if you fear those groups, then it's going to create a snare around you. Decisions that will affect your life forever. Because lying brings about more lies. Certain behaviors bring about behaviors that you just can't stop because they become habit-forming. And you create a life you can't get out of. But what's it say? What's the next sentence in verse 25? He who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. That's what we must remember. Trust in the Lord and seek His approval, not the approval of others. The next lesson found in Galatians chapter 2, I'll start with verse 17 in a moment. You are not defined by your past. So many people don't change because their past haunts them. And this keeps them from having faith in God. Well, I did this, or my dad did this, or my mother did this, I committed this. And people here at the Birdwell Chapel Church of Christ would never accept me. Look, we will, because God does. Because God instructs us to love you and to accept you. Your past does not define you. But the future that we'll have in this congregation and in eternity, that's something I want to share with you. I've counseled a lot of people. Many times felt as though I was staring Satan right in the face. And I know God can change those hearts and He can change your heart as well. So don't let your past haunt you. Galatians chapter 2, beginning with verse 17, is where these words of wisdom come into play. But if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? See, I want to be forgiven of Christ. I want to be forgiven by Him. But I can't continue sinning. I can't say, yeah, I know Jesus, but I'm going to live however I want. We can't keep doing that. May it never be, he says, verse 17. For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed... I prove myself to be a transgressor. When someone comes to Christ, they say, I'm done with my past. I'm done with my old ways. I'm done with my old sins. But you know what? A lot of people start building it back. They start putting it back together. The people they once hung out with that led them to sin, the behaviors that they engaged in so much that took them into a sinful lifestyle, they start looking back. They start opening the door a little bit. They want to look at it a little more and a little more. And before they know it, they're right back in it. Paul says, you shouldn't be rebuilding that life that you once destroyed. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I'm done with the old ways. I'm done with the old law. I'm living for God now. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live. One of the reasons we don't worry about your past is because you're living for Christ now. You're trying to live better. You're not living for yourself. You're living for Him. Because Christ lives in me when you become a Christian, baptized and added to His body, Acts chapter 2 and Mark chapter 16. I live for Christ now. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself up for me. So many people are defined by their past to themselves, and they want so bad to get rid of that. 
Some of us, however, don't know what putting away sin is. We don't often know what that means. I think that's what young people who are baptized at an early age may face. Many, such as myself, were baptized eight or nine years old because I knew about Jesus, I knew that I wanted to be with Him, and baptism is what takes us there. So as a young person, I knew what that was like. But as a teenager, as a teenager, all of us begin to see the world in a new light. And there's all these sins that that people want to say yes to, but because we've put on Christ even so at an early age, we have to say no to those things. And I hope that you see that dynamic there. Because maybe you were baptized early on, and you need to revisit what it was to say no to sin. To say no to those things that the Scripture preaches against. You've got to say no to those things so that you can fully live for Christ. Next, Galatians chapter 3. Your worth is in Christ. We focus a lot on our accomplishments, don't we? Who are you? What do you do in school? What is your job? How many trophies do you have? How much money do you make? Well, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27 says, All of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to live that new life in Christ, as I clothe myself with Him. Halloween's going to come up in a few months. We put on outfits to look like something else. Band members, sports teams, you put on clothing to identify with that particular team, with that particular event. You clothe yourself with that. And that's what Galatians chapter 3 says. We have clothed ourselves with Christ. So let's not forget about that. That's where our worth is. Our worth is in Christ. Romans chapter 13. If you'd like to be turning there, please. Romans chapter 13, beginning with verse 11. Do this knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. Salvation is near to you. You must put on Christ you are close to. You are near salvation. Keep that in mind. Verse 12. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Put on Christ. Put on goodness. Verse 13. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. You know, I read off these sins in verse 13. And I can count numerous times of I've heard young people, of how I've heard adults, of how I've seen it on TV, that these actual sins are praised. That these actual sins are are lauded as, as a rite of passage, as something you should do. Listen, young people, young and old, if you put on Christ, you're not looking at this verse and saying, wow, I can't wait to be more involved in that in ways that I shouldn't be. You don't say that. These verses, this particular verse, verse 13, should hurt you. Why? Because you've put on Christ. Because you're not to defile Him. Because you're not to muddy that name of Jesus, the Savior of mankind. Verse 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lust. So many people keep going after the flesh. They keep lusting after those things that the passages in our our Bible say to stay away from. They keep going after those things. They make provisions to engage in them when when Paul here clearly tells the Romans, stay away from them. Stay away from them, young Christians, young and old, because you are supposed to belong to Christ. Galatians chapter 4, you are no longer a slave, you are now a child of God. Galatians chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is a owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things 
of the world. There's some debate here in verse 3 as to what Paul means about the elemental things of the world. Perhaps because he's writing to a Jewish people, maybe he's talking about the law. Some people think it to be paganism. You know, any sort of lustful things that one might engage in. But in any case, he's saying, you know what? You were once in bondage under the elemental things of the world. You were giving in to the world and you were, you were engaging in those things. And we shouldn't be. You're not, a, you're not a slave anymore. Let's look at chapter 4 and verse 7. Therefore you are no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. We are a slave to anything we can't say no to. I have a tough time saying no to pizza and homemade ice cream. I have a tough time saying no to that stuff. But a lot of people have a tough time saying no as well to other fleshly things. Now pizza is not going to condemn me to an eternity in hell, now is it? It's not going to do that. However, the sins that were mentioned just a moment ago in Romans chapter 13 might very well do that for you. Don't be a slave to those things. I want to stop, okay? I want, I want to quit this. I want to, I want to quit this sensuality. I want to quit this carousing. I want to quit this drunkenness. Dale, I really do, and I know you do, but the only way that you can is to be honest with yourself. Don't quit it long enough to be in here, and then when you go out, you pick it right back up again. It's something you've got to quit and stay away from for the rest of your life so that you can be pleasing to God because we are a child of God now. We're not a slave to those things. We're supposed to be a bondservant of His because He offers that freedom. Galatians chapter 5 gives us another tip that we can live by in this world. Don't be led by your emotions. Galatians chapter 5, verses 25 and 26 say this, If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. You see, we're supposed to be led by the Spirit of God, by the Word of God, not by our emotions. Verse 26, Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. In other words, if we're all led by the Spirit here, we're not going to be enemies, you see. If we, and if there is a conflict, we're going to work it out. Why because we're led by the Spirit. So often, our emotions win the best of us, make us say, make us do things that we shouldn't, make us post things on Facebook that we shouldn't. Because the article we see that was written explicitly to make you angry and to make you share it to generate ad revenue for the website, whenever you share that, you see, you're probably following your emotions rather than seeing how true it is, or how real it is, or how much good it's actually going to do for you. So what do you live by? Our emotions are not good things to live by at all. Proverbs 12 and verse 16, A fool's anger is known at once. When somebody gets angry, you know it. You know it very quickly. But a prudent man conceals dishonor. Or another translation says, he ignores an insult. Proverbs 16, 32. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who captures a city. You see, it's tough to control your emotions, isn't it? If you can control your emotions, you're better than a mighty person. If you can control that angry spirit, you're greater than someone who might capture a city. It's a tough thing to do, but we've got to use our brains. See, people come to me in my counseling office because they have followed their emotions entirely too much. Well, people say, well, I feel that it's right. I know it in my heart. Listen, that's not based on an objective truth. That's not based on the Word of God, which is how we must define our actions. Many people say, you know, love conquers all. All we need is is love. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. Love is important, right? For the one who does not love not who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So yeah, some of that's right. But John chapter 14 and verse 15 says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And there are all kinds of commandments that go against 
following one's emotions. Number one, for instance, the Spirit of God, the Word of God, teaches that homosexuality is wrong. Yet there are many people who would try to say that it's right, that I feel that it's right. Nowhere in Scripture will you find that God says that it's okay. That God says that that sort of lifestyle is a good one. There are those, however, who struggle with this. They want to be pleasing to God. And many who want out of that lifestyle work to curb the desire that they know is unnatural and that is sinful. Galatians 5 and verse 24 says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. We have to not follow our emotions because Paul told the Galatians church in chapter 5 and verse 24, and throughout Scripture, you've got to crucify your fleshly desires. You've got to follow what God says. So guess what? Don't follow your emotions, but be led by the Spirit. And where do we find out about that? Through the Word of God. Lastly, Galatians chapter 6. We learn to not grow weary. Verse 9 says, Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. It's tough, been tough these last few months to maintain a worship schedule, being at home, to do other things associated with the pandemic. It's been difficult. But Paul tells the Galatians, don't lose heart in doing good, for in due time you will reap if you do not grow weary. In other words, keep doing the right thing. And if you don't grow weary, you'll come out better in the end, and you'll see. What is it that makes you weary? Doing good, a lot of times, makes people weary. Doing what we know to be the right thing. Why? Because a lot of times we don't see the reward. A lot of times we don't see an immediate payoff in doing what we believe to be the right thing. Raising good kids takes time. Creating a good marriage takes time. Being a good person is tough but difficult. Ephesians 3 and verse 13, Paul tells the Christians at Ephesus to not lose heart at my tribulation on your behalf, for they are your glory. So don't, don't worry about me that I'm in jail. Don't lose that heart, you see. Don't lose that heart over this tribulation, but glory in it, because we're suffering for the cause of Christ. So let us not lose heart in doing good, because the good we do will be rewarded at some point. We must persevere. Right now it's tough these days for some people who are trying to work and earn a living. Right now it's tough for Christians who can't come and meet as much as they like because we would like to mingle a bit more. I know it's tough. But keep doing the right thing. Keep on persevering because as you sow that correctly, as you sow that, you're going to reap those benefits. You're going to reap the goodness that you've done. Job chapter 17 and verse 9 says, Nevertheless, the righteous will hold to his way, and he who has clean hands will grow stronger and stronger. Keep doing the right thing, Job tells us. Keep sowing the good, and eventually you will reap it. You will reap those benefits of doing the right thing. So how has your behavior brought you to Christ? How has your behavior made you a better person? How has it made you a Christian these days? I hope that it has. I hope that you are a Christian. I hope that you are a baptized believer. I hope that you have given your heart to Christ and are working to live not a perfect life, but a life that you can say, you know, I love my Savior and He loves me. Perhaps there are a lot of changes that need to occur in your life. Maybe some thought changes. Maybe behavior changes. Maybe emotional changes. Whatever the case, I hope that you will see this morning from the lessons from Galatians that there are things that you might need to change in your life and I hope that you'll take that opportunity this morning to put on Christ in baptism or to ask Him to forgive you of any sin that might be in your life. If you have one of those needs, please come forward as we stand and sing.